it's my great pleasure to introduce today's talk by Satnam Singh. Um, it's, this is an unusual seminar. It's a joint AIAI, ANC, ICSA, ILCC, IPAB, and LFCS seminar. That's all of the informatics research institutes, I think. Uh, it's also a Scottish Programming Languages Institute distinguished lecture. Um, I'll just say a little bit about Satnam. Uh, he's a fellow at the machine learning company Grok, uh, where he works on a mixture of chip design, formal hardware verification, and machine learning compilers. Uh, he did his PhD at the University of Glasgow on the analysis of hardware descriptions. He's held academic positions at Glasgow and Birmingham, and he's worked in industry for Xilinx, Microsoft, twice at Google, Facebook, and now he works for startup Grok. Uh, his work spans quite a few areas, ranging from functional programming, compilers, formal verification, hardware design, most recently for machine learning chips, distributed systems, and optimization of mobile applications. Uh, some of the highlights of his work include his seminal work on domain-specific languages for hardware design, which he did at Xilinx, his development of the Kubernetes container orchestration system at Google, and most recently, his work that he's going to talk about today on the design of hardware for machine learning at Grok. I'm really excited to hear him tell us more about that. So please welcome Satnam. Thank you, Father. Thank you for joining me that soon. It's a, a great honor to be invited to give a SPLI Distinguished Lecture. And I've got a message for any SPLI PhD students in the audience. I worked through a diverse, diverse range of technical problems over my career, but an enduring aspect has been applicability of my programming languages education honed at the functional programming group at the Glasgow University. This has given me a mental toolkit for solving problems in many domains beyond functional programming, often helping me to find powerful abstractions that lead to efficient solutions. To the PL students in the audience, I hope in this talk, I can convince you of the advantages of a PL mindset that go beyond the domain of PL itself. Thanks to my daughter, Karen, who produced this image. She's in the audience at the back there, and she's a Haskell programmer and a final year CS student at the University of Strathclyde. This week's cover of The Economist magazine is about the computational requirements needed to create breakthroughs in AI, especially requirements for special purpose hardware for powering the machine learning models that capture the world's attention right now. You might love or hate AI, but I feel that wider society should have a better technical understanding of this technology, the nuclear weapons of our age, if it is to regulate their use, enforce AI's safety, and develop standards for AI ethics and the guardrails for the use of AI. For that, we should look under the hood of AI and take a peek. I work at a company called Grok, where we take open weight large language models, LLMs, trained by other companies and run them efficiently at scale on our own hardware based on our own special machine learning chips, serving queries with low latency and high throughput. Some of the models we run are the Llama 3 models from Meta Facebook, the Gemma models, the Gemma models from Google, and models from Mistral AI. Why do these companies that train these open weight models at huge cost give them away for free to the world? For this presentation, I asked Jeff Dean, who's the chief scientist at Google and DeepMind, this very question. And his response was, we believe providing open source models like the Gemma family that are high quality and have low infant latency is important and that a developer community will figure out interesting things to do with these models. Well, I think it's great to see these large companies contributing these open source models to the wider world. And indeed, we see the developer community creating many innovative applications on top of the LLMs that we host at Grok. In this talk, I'll give you a glimpse into the engine room at Grok that powers these open weight models, describing the architecture of the special chips that we use to run these models, illustrating some of the programming models for these chips. And I'll give you an overview of a large-scale deployment of a specific open weight model from Meta Facebook. But first, let's have a demo. And uh, how do I make this happen? <laughs> okay, um, I've asked an LLM running on our special chips 
through a special kind of sorting program in Haskell and we'll, uh, uh, that we'll see more of later. And the answer comes back very quickly. Uh, it, 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 it comes at a rate of 1,200 tokens per second. So you've got to answer quickly at low latency and at a huge pace at high throughput. So that's one of the kind of unique special things that we have. This is very fast compared to running LLMs on more conventional hardware. We also provide programmatic access to a variety of open weight foundation models, charging based on the number of tokens consumed and produced. This creates an ecosystem for people to develop custom AI applications. And, uh, uh, and these LLMs are used as a core engines to, for powering hundreds and thousands of applications that people have built with our tools. But first, just let me tell you a story about how I got involved with machine learning chips in the first, uh, in, the, in the first place. In 2012, I just joined Google after having worked for many years on programming models for FPGA-based hardware acceleration at, uh, at Microsoft. My desk used to be just behind the capital G in this building, a famous building you might have seen in the BBC News or, or in the newspaper. A friend told me about a meeting just about to start an adjacent building, which had something to do with special purpose hardware for machine learning and suggested I crash it, which, which, I, which I duly did. <clears throat> Let me just do a bit of something right here. So I, so I barged into this room and, uh, and I looked around at the people around me and I thought, hmm, I probably should not be here because all the other people in this room were the great and good of Google. Jeff Dean, Urs Holzer, Sam Gagamont, and Jeff Hinton. None of them who I'd met before. I didn't know these people. I, I asked a question about using analog hardware for machine learning, and I was duly slapped down by Hinton. However, I did make a connection with Jeff Dean, which turned out to be very useful. A bit later, I stumbled across someone called Jonathan Ross, a talented and totally inappropriately used engineer at Google's Manhattan office who really wanted to work on machine learning chips. I introduced Jonathan to Jeff Dean to propose that Jonathan work on the first machine learning chip at Google called the TPU, which stands for Tensor Processing Unit. Jonathan worked on his chip, and after several other projects, he created his own machine learning company called Grok. He wanted to start the company in our garage, but my wife said no. So he had to find, he had to find, he had to find, 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 find office space. He's now my boss. Uh, he's an amazingly technical CEO uh, he's, he's got a high degree of proficiency in quite exotic hardware and software languages like Haskell, Agda, Bluespec. You can see the blueprints of Jonathan's technical taste across the company. For example, much of a compiler for machine learning models is written in Haskell. And, jo and Jonathan featured recently in Time Magazine in the list of most influential pe people in AI. So Grok is a, is a relatively small company based in North America, headquartered in Mountain View, California. And we have a compiler team in, tr in Toronto as well. Most of us work re remotely. We don't, we, 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 don't, we, we don't go into the office. And it's a David and Goliath situation. We are an absolutely tiny company. This, is, this box represents the, the stock market value of NVIDIA, or what we'd like to think as our main competitor. And this is our private valuation. So we really are a very, very, very small uh, company that we're trying to take on this uh, giant behemoth. Before talking about machine learning hardware and why the industry has resorted to the use of GPUs, TPUs, and other specialized chips, let's understand the computational needs of large language models and appreciate why regular processors struggle with these workloads. In 2017, a landmark paper from Google called Attention is All You Need proposed the notion of a transformer which could transform its entire sequence of words by using something called an attention technique to analyze in parallel all possible positions for words in an input sequence. This technique was indeed transformative for the improvements in efficiency and quality compared to previous techniques, which only examined, wor examined words in the sequence in a fixed order. I was working at Google at the time uh, that this paper came out. And, I, and I, on, on, a, on a different special machine learning chip. And, when, and this was such a transformative paper, it gave us pause for thought. I mean, and it made us think, uh, is the silicon we're designing no longer, is it relevant anymore in the, in, the new, in, the, in the new world order? The computational core of LLMs are components called decoders, which are composed together in a chain 
with the output of one decoder fed into the input of the next decoder. The LAMA 370 billion model, one of the ones that we host, similar to what I ran my query on at the beginning, has 80 of these stacked on top of each other. For the purpose of this presentation, all we need to know that it, is that decoders predict the next token in a sequence based on the uh, input sequence it's seen so far and, and on, based on previous predictions. Here's an example of an LLM trying to predict the next word task, a task we call inference. So we, we, we provide some context. We start off with the quick brown, and then we're, we're going to, and, and that, this goes into the input processing stage of the, of the, of the LLM. The English text goes to a tokenizer, which converts it into some format that's more useful for machine learning algorithms to work with. And what happens is output generation from this step on. So we make a distinction between input and output generation. This will become later on. And the, the system predicts that the next word is going to be going to be Fox. It's going to do quite a bit of matrix multiply math to work that out. And then based on that, it predicts the next word and it predicts the next word. And, and this is all done through a, 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 sequence of, a sequence of decoders. That's the core thing that's happening. This is what we're trying to accelerate. The decoders from previous slides are the workhorses of large language model inference, which accounts for most of the computational complexity. So let's take a closer look at them. The decoder mechanism works in three steps. The input matrix goes through three projections referred to as query, key, and value. These three QKV matrices are inputs to a step called attention, attention mechanism, which I'll say more about shortly. The final result is fed into feedforward network, which helps transform the information captured by the attention mechanisms into a form that is useful for the next stage of decoding. The attention block uh, performs operations over the matrices Q, K, and V. The Q matrix represents a query. The K matrix represents a key that can be used to create information about the other tokens. And the dot product of Q and K determines the attention sco store, score, how strongly one token should attend to or focus on another. The V matrix contains information used to weight each of the attention scores, which is the final output of the attention alert. This is a matrix matrix multiply comp intensive computation, which makes it compute bound, not memory bound. CPUs, so how, could we run this on our processor? Well, the problem with that is that CPUs are latency machines. CPUs are designed to do one thing as quickly as possible to reduce latency, and they're optimized to execute a sequence of irregular instructions with arbitrary memory access patterns. Their low computational intensity and a large distance from off-chip memory makes them a poor fit for matrix-matrix multiply. The high computational intensity of matrix-matrix multiplication from transformers as well as other machine learning algorithms is driving an insatiable appetite for higher performance hardware for performing these computations. And most of his demand has been met with GPUs. GPUs are throughput machines. They are designed to work well with high computational intensity. They're designed to do many things efficiently in parallel rather than do one thing as quickly as possible. They work best when the processing cores could be oversubscribed with matrix matrix multiply work, with lots of computation overlapped with lots of memory reads, trying to hide the cost of memory latency. Consequently, G GPUs have been in huge demand, both for the training of machine learning models and for running inference for machine learning models. NVIDIA has the lion's share of this market, and its stock market valuation has skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Is there an alternative to CPUs or GPUs, especially for machine learning inference, which can be performed effectively with quantized arithmetic? Well, the first, thing to, uh, the, 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 the first thing to understand is that architecturally, we are, what we have is, what I've got to show is very, very different. It's found the GPU systems are a collection of multiple GPUs connected by switches that contain huge amounts of high bandwidth memory, HBM. The critical piece of GPUs that sit outside the core of a chip. It works great for managing these LMs over many months of training with massive parallel tasks, but they're not optimized at all for inference workloads. Inference is sequential. The way you talk is not through parallel work streams. What is said moments ago is extremely important to what is said now. Language is sequential, and inference must meet that demand at the speed of language and understanding. And that's why latency becomes, uh, becomes important. As a result, that HBM that sits outside the chip must each time cache weights uh, in and out just to generate the next sentence. 
that's a very inefficient and costly process. It's almost like you're manufacturing a car and you were to break the machine down after it was built and then build it back up again every time you need to make a new car. Extremely inefficient, very energy, and very energy intensive. Let's look into architecture of the Grok LPU, which has architectural features which give it high throughput, but also low latency. One of the core pieces of technology at Grok are special purpose chips for accelerating machine learning inference tasks, which we call language processing units or LPUs. Let's look at some of the core architectural principles behind its, uh, behind its des uh, design. We anticipated the need to implement large models and, ru and, and running them efficiently requires scale. The more compute there is at the edge, the more compute will be needed at the core. We create factory assembly line, uh, a factory assembly line processing abstraction within the chip. We don't have external switches between our chips. Instead, the assembly and abstraction continues sufficiently at the multi-chip level. We have statistically scheduled networks, so there's never congestion. As things happen, the sequence is predicted ahead of time and flows right through. We benefit from not just software and memory integrated in chip, but outside, so, so the whole LLM can be loaded once and it just runs like clockwork. To see this visually, notice that the tokens move seamlessly. Your sentence or words, are set up like an assembly line. And as they move quickly across to, they move quickly across to form the output. This is how we achieve high performance inference that you saw at the beginning of this presentation. It's critical to understand that the architecture advantage we have is linked to our software that's embedded and built in the, into the foundation. What we've been able to achieve is designed as a deterministic and predictive way of how an inference should be done. While the hub and spoke architecture of GPU is great for training, it is not designed to solve inference and reach the performance levels that we, that, that we have. This is a picture of the 60 nanometer V1 language processing unit silicon chip that, that's currently deployed. And that's the chip that was used to res respond to the query that you, you saw at the beginning. The architecture is very different from a CPU or a GPU. And it's designed to efficiently move data lockstep along horizontal lanes on the chip, intersecting it with computations like matrix multiplication or vector operations like TANH, as well as read and writes to distributed memories. And this, this, this diagram here tries to illustrate this lane-based uh, 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 nature of computation. Data is steered almost as if it's going for railway tracks and points, and, they inter and it can either bypass things by going to the register or go into a process unit, be processed, and go then back onto the railway track to move to the, the next point. So it's a very, very different computational model. There's not a program counter saying, you know, should I branch to point A or point B? Uh, the, 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 when you compile a model for the chip, the code is all straight line. A code. There's no if then else. You and when you compile a model, you know exactly what you're going to do and in what cycle you're going to do it. So, so compared to GPU, we have no complex memory hierarchy like you saw in the GPU. We only have lots of SRAM that's broken up to tiny parts and scattered across the chip, which gives us a high level of uh, concurrency. And we're totally deterministic. Th that means when you compile your program. At compile time, we know on every clock cycle what instruction will execute. And this is a highly unusual property for you to have with any program, uh, whether it's running on your processor or your GPU. And we ruthlessly exploit this capability to get many advantages through performance and, and, uh, and scalability. As a consequence, we, we don't su suffer from tail latency. The key components on the chip are blocks of distributed memory, 230 megabytes in total. Parallel matrix multiply engines, which give you 750 teraops per second for 8-bit integers, 188 terabit op operations per second for 16-bit floating point values. A data switch that can shift, transpose, and permute lane data, and support for direct chip-to-chip -chip networking, which in aggregate can give you 480 gigabytes per second of, 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 of bandwidth. So a very, very different kind of, uh, a very different kind of machine. In each, lane, in each lane, there are stream registers. And that's what helps to move the data left or right, which move in lockstep. Every cycle, your know, data is moving from one register to the registers. And, and within a lane, there's a bunch of them that go east and a bunch of them that go, a bunch of them that go west. Uh, in the center of a chip, you have the vector unit that does things like TANH, 
not shown the, uh, and th then you have the memory blocks on the left, the right hand side. And there's 144 from each side, and then uh, for, for, and then there's a, the switch network, the SXM, and then for the MXM are the big matrix multiplier engines. Computation mostly occurs along lanes and is steered through computational blocks. Data is read from memories, moves in lockstep along uh, uh, each clock tick. Some streams going east, the other streams going west. As the data stream travels in lockstep, it may interact with processing elements like matrix multiply, tan H, and then eventually it's retired back to memory. So, the, so it's very good if you can do one read and then perform many, many, many operations on it before writing it back to a, a, a memory. That gives you the best, that gives you the, the best performance. The big hammers on the architecture are the matrix multiply units on either side of the chip. They're designed to work most efficiently when the weights are loaded with special weight buffers and remain constant for a stretch of time. And then the activations are streamed in a clock tick at a time. So in machine learning, you have a lot of situations where you have a weight matrix that is constant for a while, constant for a while and then the activations, the, you know, the pixels from your image that might contain a cat or a dog go through and, and the weights are going to try and help you whether see whether if this is a cat or a, a, a cat or a dog. So that's a fundamental core operation for machine learning, algor machine learning algorithms. Each vector unit contains 16 ALUs and they can be chained together to perform composite oper uh, operations. And then uh, when you compile your program, it compiles into uh, an instruction set. And the instruction set basically, that, that tells you know, in the railway tracks of the points it, it tells you how the data should be, how the data should be steer, steered. So we've got instructions for uh, 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 fetching data, for configuring the memories, for conf configuring how the vector units you use, how the multiplications are done, how to chip to chip interconnects work, and how to move data from one lane to another. The basic uh, 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 arithmetic operations are chip, the V1 chip works on are 16-bit floating point, 8-bit integers and unsigned 8-bit uh, 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 integers. And for inference, that's a pretty good collection of numeric types. The, the universe is moving fast and developing lots of new numeric formats. Uh, number, number formats and precision accuracy, I think, become quite exciting again as we've moved away from the, the, the uh, two main IEEE, uh, IEEE standards. And uh, I, I've worked in the V2 chip at Grok, and in that you're going to see an even more interesting collection of numerics that are supported in this. So how? So that's the hardware. There's a kind of unusual, synchronous, kind of lockstep, a highly concurrent parallel uh, machine. It doesn't look like a processor which gets an instruction and tells it we, how to which arbitrary memory location to get one argument, which other arbitrary location to get another argument, maybe multiply them, and what location to store it in, and then do the next thing. It's a very streamlined, flowing thing. Like you want to feel like you're on a motorway and you're just going and going as long as possible with no traffic lights or or, or red bits. Okay, so we. we we, we have a compiler, and the, 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 the compiler we have at can compile machine learning models written in PyTorch. That's the most popular, uh, it's a Python DSL for Meta, and it's one of the most popular ways of implementing machine learning models. We have support for other frameworks like OpenXLA, that's one of the things I work on personally, which allows a compiler to ingest models written in TensorFlow and JAX, which are also Python DSLs from uh, Google. There's also an experimental Haskell-based DSL called Haste that I, that I work on, that I'm going to tell you a wee bit about. A comp compiler's primary input is the Onyx Linear Algebra Compute Graph representation. It's a binary protobuf defined by Microsoft. And this gets extracted from machine, from DLS, typically from, from, from Python. And it's, 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 a, it's a linear algebra com compute graph, right? There's a, a, so it doesn't tell you much about resource usage, and about time or space. So it's quite an abstract thing. And the purpose of compiler is to take this kind of infinite time space graph and fold it up and shear it and stretch it and make it fit onto a finite uh, 2D compute surface, which is our, which, which is our chip. 
it, it has some similarities to tasks like, like some of you might be familiar with, like writing in Verilog and doing synthesis to have your circuit mapped onto an FPGA. And indeed, many of the people who work on the compilers for this, their previous background was an FPGA synthesis. And that's why we have a Toronto office, because Toronto is a hot, University of Toronto is a hotbed of FPGA tooling and synthesis. Just to make things super concrete, here is a very simple PyTorch program that just uh, adds two uh, uh, tensors, X and Y. It just does an element-wise add. So this is used. This is uses the PyTorch uh, framework, and th then you 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 can write some blurb here, which causes it to emit the, the corresponding protobuf, that compute graph. And when you do that, if you were to look at the the textual version of a compute graph, this you know, this is what it produces. It produces a node with the addition. It's a very straightforward thing. Just as a node with x and y in, and the result. And this is what goes into our compiler. And the compiler you know, processes this and generates a program, generates an assembly file. And what's odd about this assembly file is, you know, in, 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 for your machine code, if you wrote in C, you wrote some machine code, you'd have some instructions, you know, and, and the, the, you know what address they get compiled into, and you can see what sequence and what the branching is. Our assembler, what it does is for each unit, it, it tells you on which clock cycle there's some activity. So for that addition that you saw, in, uh, in that PyTorch program. That addition, which is that gets compiled to a saturated add instruction for uh, 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 happens in cycle 142. So that's kind of odd, right? You know an exact, the, the, the assembly is not, not labeled with some arbitrary number. It is actually the, nano, you know, the nanoseconds that that instruction is going to execute. I've just shown you just one unit, but if you looked at a whole assembly file, for each unit, it will compute in which nanoseconds or what operations executed. And it's a file that gets generated in your directory. And at that moment, you know what's going to happen if you were to run your model on the chip. And then you can look at performance problems, you know, debug performance and congestion issues, et cetera. And that's one of the advantages we get from determinism. Uh, uh, otherwise, we couldn't, otherwise we'd actually have to run real experiments on real chips or one of those chips and look at TO latency and kind of statistically measure things. We have none of that. We just know what's going to happen as soon as you've compiled your program, which is quite an unusual, but quite useful property. I, I think nuclear weapons level technology requires nuclear grade technology for programming it. And my chosen nuclear weapon of, cho of choice is functional programming with dependent types. So internally at Grok, I've developed a domain specific language inside Haskell that I call Haste, which can be programmed to use at LPUs, with a level of type safety that is unachievable with normal uh, programming, uh, of normal programming or normal programming languages. So you can write the same program like this and compile it. And it compiles to a, a, a different representation that a compiler can consume. This is called, it's called MLIR. Uh, uh, and it's a, a, a very commonly used framework for machine learning compilers. If you know LLVM, from regular compilers for C compilers, whatever, MLIR is the equivalent framework for writing machine learning uh, compilers. So, the, so, so Haste, the Haskell library would take that program and it would then generate this MLIR. Again, it's a very simple thing. It's very similar to the protobuf you saw earlier. It just has one operation add, tells you which, which tensors is adding and what the, what, the result, what the result type is. And then if you put it for a compiler and ran it, it would produce the same. Uh, it produces the same, same result. But what's different about Haste is that you have, can program with a level of type safety that is quite mind-bending and uh, unachievable in, in, in Python or a, any other kind of language. So I'm going to, try to like, illustrate that with an example of a sorter. Uh, and that's one of the programs that I run uh, on our chips. And, and there are very important reasons for running sorters, because one of the main operations at the end of a machine learning pipeline is called top K, where you try and pick the top N candidates features that you've recognized. And, and the guts of implementing that is to involve sorting. So I'm, gonna, so I'm gonna show you how to do a network sort because we don't have branching, right? We can't do quick sort or something like that, right? We need a sorting algorithm that's just a sequence of instructions that you run one after each other with no branching, no control flow. Then at the end, you have a sorted value. And for that, we're gonna use a network sorter called Batcher's Bitonic Sorter. And the, the, the core component of this is something that sorts two values. And we're gonna recursively, inductively create a larger sorter that can sort two to the end, uh, two to the end values. So here's an example of how we could define the two sorter. And it's done in this APL 
point free style. You get, you get your input, you fork it into two paths. One path works at the minimum of the two inputs. The, the, that's, what, that's what you see here. The other path works at the, the, uh, the, 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 the maximum of the two inputs, and then you put the things together, you put the results back together again. And this means that this, the, the second input will always be larger or equal to the, the, the first input. But what's quite unusual about this is that in the type, you see that this takes a two element array and gives you back a two element array. So if you, in your program, at any point tried to give an array that was not two in size, you would get a type error, right? You get this at compile time. The compiler refuses to compile your uh, compile your program. If you were to compile this through haste, you get a bit of MLIR code, which uh, you, where you can see you know there's been one component instantiated that's going to work at the minimum, another component instantiated that's going to work at the maximum, and then fusing the results back together, and you get uh, the final tensor back uh, uh, final tensor back out. So that's sorting two things. Let's try and sort some more things. This is a, one instance of batches by tonic. Merge sorter, and it's a network sorter. And why this, the reason this is suitable for a chip is involves, we can implement it with no control flow. We just do left to right feed forward computation. So we can represent and compile this with our architecture. And just to be absolutely concrete about what it does, it takes in a, a matrix and it sorts the columns. So if this matrix here is the, is the, is the, is the input matrix, uh, this is the result matrix. So these numbers here, uh, these numbers sorted. So that's what it's doing. So, and, and it's columns because you, you, you're feeding these numbers in in a pipeline fashion, one column after another column after another uh, after after another column. So how do we make this sorter? Well, we're going to make it recursively. Batches by tonic uh, sorter could be built by using a merger and two smaller sorters. And uh, this merger has a, this property called bi being bitonic. The, the second half of the input has to be reversed, right? So if you, if you, can, if you can maintain that property, then this, this merger is going to do the right thing. So, right, let's see if we can decompose this until we can actually get an implementation. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to recursively keep applying this picture to, to, the, to the, the bottom sorter and the top sorter, and eventually the merger will come down to just one component, which is a two sorter. Let's see how this works out. For this, we're going to define a whole bunch of combinators that are going to help us define the kind of wiring patterns and com combinators and, and divine conquer strategies that are used for this, this sorter. So one, one thing we need is co it's called riffle. I, and, and if any of you, you know, are, play cards, what does a riffle do? You, you take a deck of cards, you half it, and you go and put them together again. And that's what's happening. That, that, that's what's happening here. So the riffle is taking the the top bottom halves and kind of interleaving them to get, uh, interleaving them together. And an interesting thing about a type is that it says it needs an even sized input array and an even sized output array. So give me an even sized input array, and I will have it zip the elements together and unpair them. That's what defines Riffle. And then you will get an even size output array as a, uh, as a result. And the compiler will, infor will enforce this. In fact, if you were to write a bad definition for Riffle, like, like halve and sip, uh, in VS Code, you'll get a red squiggly in, the, in your ID editor, and you'll get an, an error message from type checker which says, well, I expected uh, an array which was from an even set of inputs to an even set of inputs, but you gave me you gave me an array from an even set of inputs to well, uh, 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 array that's even in size, but its elements are to, to, uh, uh, are, are pairs of values of, of of some other type, and that's quite mind bending. Right? You couldn't have got an error like that from Python or C plus uh, plus or 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 Go, and that's just making use of of dependent types. In, uh, in Haskell, another another operation we make we make use of is called unriffle. It's the opposite of riffle. Uh, you, you can look at riffle and just flip it over to the other side, and it has uh, pleasingly the exactly reverse definition, right? Pair, unzip, unhalf, and it also through the type system enforces it's only ever it can be given an even sized array, and it only ever gives you back an even sized array. It's, when you write these programs and you get the, them to pass a type checker, you're getting the type checker to do quite an interesting proof about your program. Uh, the, the, 
a, a very important combinator, is, which we're going to see a couple of times, is called interleave. And it's a divide and conquer strategy. Given some problem R, let's solve it by using two smaller instances of R. I'm going to take the input. I'm going to break the input by spending the even part, uh, input values to one R, smaller R, and the odd inputs to the other smaller R, run these two R's separately, and then we undo the, 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 even, uh, even, uh, the even odd separation. So this is kind of, uh, uh, this is how this is how it's defined. You 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 you, you do unriffle. You use a, a, then you do another uh, combination. I've not I've not shown you got two, which stamps down two R's. It also has a nice dependent type, and then you do and then you and then you do a riffle. and then in the type here, you, the, the, the interleave says you can give me any function that takes uh, 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 n to n values. Uh, an array of length n to array of length of some type a, and I will make you something which takes something that's t twice the size of that n, twice the size of input, and give you back something that's twice the size of input. And if you give things the wrong size, you'll get an error. If you made a mistake implementing interleave and that property was not true, you would get a, you would you would get you 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 would get a type error. So that's another example of a of a, of a dependent type. Another thing we need in our toolkit is something called evens. What that does is it takes some function which works over pairs of values takes two inputs, gives you back another two inputs, and it takes an even numbered input vector and it just slaps pairs of them across the input. Uh, and, and, you, and you can see that in the type. It requires an input, an even size an input array, an even size output array, and it works by pairing, mapping this function that you would be given as an argument across each of the pairs, and then, un, and then, un, and then unpairing. So given these things, we can define a butterfly operation. And this is what's going to implement the bitonic merger. It's going to solve the right-hand side of the picture that we saw. And this also has a very in interesting dependent type as well. Here, we have we need to know what the degree of the butterfly is. Yeah, a, a, you know, a, a degree one uh, a butterfly is just the, uh, the, two, the, the two sorter. It takes two inputs and gives you back two outputs. And a degree two butterfly will be two, uh, two, to power n, two to power two inputs, two to power two outputs. So in general, a degree n butterfly needs to have two to the n inputs, and it will always give you back two to the n results. And we codify this in the type of the function. And let's make sure that when we write and implement a butterfly, we can never make a mistake where we write a butterfly that's got the wrong, the wrong number of inputs or wrong number of outputs. And here is an inductive base case, a butterfly of degree one of some operation R is just that R. And then a, then, and then a butterfly of n plus one, where the way we, we do that is we interleave two smaller butterflies, and then we slap a bunch of evens across it. Uh, and, 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 all, and the type checker is going to keep us honest about the, si the sizes of the inputs and outputs. It's going to make sure the sizes of the input-output vectors are related to the degree n of the butterfly. So there's a butterfly of degree one, there's a butterfly of degree two, there's a butterfly of degree three, and you can, as you can see recursively, your bigger butterflies are made out of smaller uh, butterflies. And, and here's, here's how we would solve the sorter, right? Uh, 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 this is also going to be like a dependent type, which takes you know, two, uh, uh, two to the power n inputs and two to the power n outputs, depending on the degree of the butterfly. For the, for the, for the base case, for degree one, the, the sorter is just the two sorter that you saw before. It takes two inputs, produces two outputs. For a larger sorter uh, of degree n plus one, well, what do we do is we, uh, is, is we take two of batch of sorter of, that are one size smaller to solve the sub problems. Uh, we, 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 we do the reverse twiddle, which is defined by second rev that I've not shown you. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, then, and then we just make a butterfly of, of, of degree n uh, uh, to, to, to do the merge. And this is what solves this picture. It creates the batches by tonic merger sorter. And the type system is going to keep you honest about the sizes of the size, size of it. In fact, if I were to call the sorter with the array of the wrong size, here I've defined an array which is seven in size. Uh, and, I, and I type this into Visual Studio Code, I don't need to run it to get an error. The, the type system tells me you've done something wrong. I'm expecting uh, a vector of length eight, but you give me a length vector of, uh, vector of, uh, vector of length seven. So it's a whole class of errors and mistakes you simply cannot make. 
And you know, there's quite a lot of things in our compiler, which is looking for misaligned matrices of the wrong dimensions that are connected together in the wrong way, especially for very parameterized kind of designs. And I think we need to move more and more of that kind of complexity in machine learning compilers and so on into type system and prove that these bad things can never happen. And that then makes our machine learning compilers much simpler, easier to maintain, and easier to uh, easier to develop. It also lets us write much more parameterized, generic, general, generic, uh, reusable programs. Uh, so I could write a top level wrapper for this uh, uh, to to generate the the, the G ten you know, MLIR for that for the uh, for the uh, for that to for that, for that sorter and. Uh, do I do a click to uh, uh, do a space, and then I can, and you compile it onto the chip, and this is a picture of that sorter uh, run, running in values being read from uh, memory, going to the various units being processed and being written back to uh, back to memory. And there's something quite satisfying about writing just you know a few lines of carefully chosen Haskell of nice dependent types. And again, something very practical and useful as a result. And this sort of design, that is what's in our compiler. So when you run our compiler and the machine, your answers are being generated like the ones they saw before, the scheme to do the sorting in the top K, uh, that's where it, it comes from this. Although the world of uh, uh, machine learning is dominated by Python, there are other mainstream efforts to produce new languages for machine learning. And a notable example is Mojo, developed by Chris Lattner, who's famous for the LLVM compiler framework, the Swift programming language, the MLI machine learning compiler framework that we use at Grok. For this lecture, I asked Chris what motivated him to create a new language for machine learning. And his answer speaks to the fact that today we have a diverse zoo of languages and platforms that make up the machine learning world, which introduce unnecessary complexity and friction. Personally, I appreciate this perspective because I know from my own work how many different languages and frameworks I have to wrangle with every day to get things done. Let's revisit the decoder we saw earlier and spot an optimization opportunity that's based on memoization. We can apply that memoized optimization to the KV cache mechanism to transform its complexity in order to, in order to obtain the last row of Z, Z matrix we need the new row of Q and the, entire, the entirety of K, the entirety of V. However, we don't need the other rows of Q or the QK matrix multiplication. In other words, the gray parts are necessary. Moreover, the yellow part could be cached. We call this, mem this memoization technique KV caching. It's important to note that computationally speaking, once we apply this optimization, this part of the workload is now a vector matrix. Vector matrix, is a, is, is a low computational intensity operation. That means it is memory bound, not compute bound, which like matrix matrix multiplication. And that is the reason why the Grok architecture can implement LLMs with such low latency, because the KV cache values all stay within the chip in, 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 in high speed memory in, in those S banks, that, that, in those SRAMs that you see. And these values can be quickly fed into the matrix vector operations on the chip. The GPU has to make expensive off-chip accesses to distant high bandwidth memory to page in these values, cycle through them. In life, you never get something for nothing, apart from a few freedoms. And, in this, and this optimization requires some external memory to hold the KB cache. Returning to our inference diagram, we can see that input, input processing is computation intensive task that requires matrix, matrix, multiply, right? Uh, you know, but the subsequent output generation operations can now be performed by matrix vector operations. So although this is matrix, matrix, this could be matrix vector, matrix vector, matrix vector for each token that you can generate. And this is what we can do incredibly efficiently on our chip because we can fetch the cache values directly from these fast S SRAMs that's within the chip have them participate in, in the vector multiplication and write the results back. And that's what you can't do in the GPU. And that's what gives us this incredibly low latency and high throughput that you saw at the beginning of the talk. Right? Our, our, our LPU chip is great, but we need to compose many LPUs to implement a large, lang a, a large language model. So the, 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 these LPU chips, they're hosted in the PCI card, called the Grot card, and eight, eight of these go in a node. Uh, and uh, 
So that's that's a chip. The chip goes into this. It's, it's a PCI card. And then eight of these fit into a node. And then we have eight nodes that we put into a rack. Actually, we have nine. We have one spare for a spare for a, for a redundancy. And typically, several Grok racks are used to run a specific instance of an LLM. Inside a Grok node, we have all-to-all -all connections where each chip acts both as a processor and a router. There is no per hop router arbitration for dynamic contention. In other words, we use cut through routing, which gets us lower latency. There is no hardware-based global adaptive routing. In fact, we don't have any hardware routing. This lets us massively scale up with predictable performance. There's no congestion sensing via back pressure. All network delays are known in advance, and we can get high utilization at high load. Since we have a single clock, we can communicate at low latency. The software knows that data should be sent from one chip and received uh, another chip at a given cycle. We do not need to wait for an acknowledgement. We don't need a switch to compute kernels for networking. For compute kernels for networking, there is no need to communicate with network and phrase controller. Data can simply be read out of SRAM and sent from one chip to another in a handful of cycles. For a ten thousand chip system, an LPU can access two terabytes of global memory in less than three microseconds. So let's see how large language models are implemented on racks of these LPUs. Recall the guts of Lama 3 70, 70 billion is 80 decoders cascaded in sequence. Our implementation works by using pipeline parallelism and by spreading 80 decoders across 10 racks, cutting up the KV cache into smaller and smaller pieces until they're good fit onto individual LPU chips. The query that you saw at the start of this lecture starts at rack zero and makes its way through all 10 racks with the outputs be generated by the rack 10. That's it. Thermal considerations are, 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 are one of the biggest challenges we face when trying to deploy these systems at scale. Determinism allows us to characterize and predict the power consumption of the chip at a cycle accurate level. Providing this information to compiler allows us to view the power profile graphs as shown in this image and, uh, and identify scheduled instructions that cause power spikes, which result in voltage uh, droops at the transistor level. Unless such voltage groups are, uh, uh, usually such voltage groups are unpredictable on non-deterministic architectures, thereby causing computational failures and error injection into the data path. The usual method to avoid such fa failure is to raise the voltage level on the chip and pay a significant power consumption penalty. Our deterministic architecture allows us to smooth out those peaks at compile time itself. With minimal performance loss, and we can prove computational reliability as well as safe per consumption by allowing the chip to operate at the same frequency by lowering the voltage to a bare minimum needed for achieving the required performance. In addition, this deterministic control of power consumption uh, on the chip allows us to expand the concept to thermal heat dissipation as well. Next generation silicon designs are focused on 3D stacking of chips where the heat dissipation from the bottom die is a crucial limiting factor for enabling those technologies. Fine grained control of power consumption due to determinism allows Grok to unlock these technologies much more easily. Now I'll say a few words about how we use formal techniques to formally verify our hardware, uh, hardware designs. For the formal verification of the V2 chip, I've made, extensive, I've made use of exactly the same abstractions that were used to design the HDSL for programming the LPU. One of the components on our V2 chip is a BNS network, which allows us to arbitrarily permute inputs to outputs. A HSTYLE DSL description in a, 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 a called LAVA, which is a, another library that is a, a variant, which shares the same combinators as, as HES does, it's used to, to it uses literally the same combinators as used program chip, like interleave. We use this to also make the hardware implementation, for example, for the Bernie switch, for the purposes of verification. And from this diagram you saw was automatically generated from the Haskell code before, which is yet another uh, dependently type recursive description of a of a BNS of a BNS network. As you can see, it, it, it uses interleave and evens that you saw from the, the exact same function from it's the same module in in the source tree at, uh, at Grok. And there's you know and, and you I won't go into details of a BNS which works, but it has a base case where a, a degree one BNS just so, so will swap two things around based on some traditional input, and and then you make you make a bigger BNS of smaller BNSs. 
this picture gets drawn from one interpretation of this, and another interpretation will produce hardware that implements it. And we use that hardware to make a golden reference model, which we then use to formally equivalence check against a handwritten BNS network and prove that the, you know, to, to prove confidence that we built the right thing. We also have, uh, that, that this BNS network participates as a component in a more complex circuit with lots of state elements and pipelining. So we also write temporal logic properties. Uh, uh, these, are, these ones are written in, uh, written in system uh, uh, Verilog. And then we run a model checker to prove properties about this, uh, uh, about, about this component. And this helps us catch many, many, uh, 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 many, many uh, subtle errors that are not taught by the normal type, normal types of testing that people do at uh, at Grog. So, wh so what next? Well, uh, so I, so I've mainly worked on the hardware implementation of the V2 chip, especially for the thermal th aspects you just saw, and for controlling. Uh, uh, Power consumption, as well as the you know, form of verification in some aspects, uh, 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 as well. So, uh, uh, so this chip will hopefully, you know, uh, uh, relatively soon, be produced. It's going to be manufactured by Samsung uh, on a four nanometer uh, uh, process in Taylor in Texas, and I'm looking forward to it being deployed and running our models fa much faster with much uh, lower latency and lower uh, low, lower energy consumption. Uh, another thing we, we, we're aiming to do in the future is to use our chip as a component of larger systems. So, so instead of taking a chip and putting it in a package and putting pins on it, we, we, we exploit the fact that we've got these chip-to-chip -chip interconnects and we, and, we, and, and we want to use standard on-chip system interconnect uh, standards like UCIE and connect to other components. So the, this machine learning, deterministic machine learning engine is a component, a participant of a larger of, of a larger system. That's an exciting direction we hope to go in the future. If you want to know more about the architecture of our chips, there are two ISCA papers that you can uh, easily Google and track down. Finally, reflecting on how I started this talk, about my story about crashing the first TPU meeting at Grok, let me recommend that you crash lots of meetings you're not invited to, and you ask awkward, unwelcome questions, because you never know where that might lead you. Tell them that Satnam sent you. Thank you.